Last of Us is among my favorite games of all time, and with the show being so good, I really couldn't excuse myself from not covering everything this universe has on offer in video form. This will be a short and sweet one, is what I said at the start of writing this, but uh, things changed. And don't expect many DLC videos from the channel, but this series is special and Ellie deserves it. Fireflies? Get down! Oh. You could totally play this as a little one-shot story. I highly don't recommend it, but you 100% could. Everything that you need to understand is presented to you quickly, and this little opening death dodge. And thematically, is very focused, and has this bittersweet, heartbreaking ending. And holy f**k, am I going to use this video as an excuse to talk about how much I actually really enjoyed the Part 1 remake. Is Naughty Dog coming for Todd Howard's crown for having three versions of their game come out in under 10 years? Yeah. But he could use the competition. Is the $70 kind of ridiculous? Absolutely. There is almost no excusing that price when the remaster is available for $20 and has factions. Yes, the visual overhaul is top of its class, but at the end of the day, even this visual upgrade will one day be dated. So we are really being sold the most beautiful band-aid fix with less content. Uh, that was quite negative. Factions is a dope multiplayer, and I can't wait to see what they're developing for their standalone multiplayer game. I do also get a continuity boner for the first game now, officially being titled Part 1. It always made me feel weird not seeing that after the release of the second game. Now that it's called that, going from the first to the second feels so much smoother. Yeah! Flirting! Ellie not missing a beat, though, defending herself. She did say the school's teacher to kill fireflies. I thought I was bitten. I know. It was kind of awesome. Probably exactly what Marlene says to Ellie after she finds out she's immune. It really does look immaculate, though, right up there with part two, and makes that transition between them so much smoother and not jarring at all. When we think we've hit a wall in technology progress, some motherfucking bad dog just rolls up and knocks that bitch down. I'm replaying this with my girlfriend right now, and it is amazing to be able to just look into a character's eyes and feel the human in there. At this point, at least for me, there is no disconnect anymore when the performance capture is translated into the game. Between this remaster, because that's what it really is, and Avatar 2, we've got some really exciting things to look forward to in the future performance capture in games. I'm sure Naughty Dog is already learning new things and gonna try and make their own version of Bioshock and Subnautica. You're a firefly. Joel's dig at Marlene about hiring pretty young at the side of Ellie isn't completely unfounded. Child labor laws tend to go the way of Joel's daughter when it comes to the apocalypse. It's almost morning. And I have military drills. You know, where we learn how to kill fireflies. Freaking dumb humans not being able to get along and fight the bigger threat. They should be teaching infected defense tactics because... But those drills are 100% the reason why the fireflies are fighting them. To create the better world where people don't have to worry about the thumb of martial law. You can see the feelings people harbor towards them supporting this on the walls throughout. <sighs> oh, come on. When have we ever gotten into trouble? Huh. I really wonder if this is some sort of foreshadowing to events to come. And also the perfect segue back to Ellie literally being in the biggest trouble she's ever been in. Something that Love Boy really shines with is these transitions. I love this wide. Framing Ellie in her situation objectively. Showing how, while her world is shattering right now, the world itself is uncaring as it has dealt with this many years ago. Also, notice the windows. Ellie is framed by the part of it with light pouring through. She is literally the only light for Joel's survival right now. Look for the light, anyone? Ellie is a pseudo firefly? Callus. Oh, Callus. Their sacrifice will never be forgotten. I'll be back in a flash. <laughs> Kinda, actually. This is all technically a flashback for us. So in playing, for Joel, she really was back in a flash. I love the title for this DLC. Just really perfect. Riley left Ellie behind. Ellie left Riley behind, even if not by choice. Joel left Tess behind for Ellie. And in the end, Riley and Ellie decide not to leave the people they love most in the world. Ellie and Joel, respectively. I totally got this. Alright, now where the f do I go? You gotta be your own hype man, but once you're out of earshot of daddy, you can be real with yourself. This is the first ever time that Ellie's actually on her own for once after meeting Joel. Naughty Dog made the very much right choice skipping this section and just boofing all the way to the middle of winter for all the confusion of what happened to Joel and Ellie being quite proficient through having to survive some time without Joel's help. Just like with many of Sony's first party titles, part one has a plethora of accessibility options to really tailor the game to how you want to play. As someone who doesn't find walking around for 10 minutes because I just merely miss a small hole I was supposed to crawl through engaging, I am loving the navigation assist in these newer games. What the hell? Did you just swallow the pills and leave the bottle? Ellie clearly has never stolen someone's pills before. Part 1 always went to the RDR and The Last of Us Part 2 school of picking up things, where everything has a super nice animation before putting it in their magic bag of holding. We also see every collectible in our hands in Part 1 rather than having to view it in our bag. Does it really matter? No. But it's cool nonetheless. This was written all the way back from when the outbreak first started. 35 right, 3 left, 31 right. 
Oh, I'm sad. Another addition to part one is putting in all the codes you found manually, but no, Ellie wants to show me how smart she is and not let me feel like I've got a higher IQ than two. Anyway, it's there everywhere with Joel, so. I'm satisfied. We this guy's been locked in here since the beginning of the outbreak, per the note we just read, which explains how this isolated room became completely overcome with cordyceps. These mini stories are some of the most fun things to find that add depth to the world, especially learning of what became of the helicopter crew. Also, Ellie just getting smacked by spores shows just how easy it really is to get infected. You can't trust a single door anymore. There are tons of parallels between the flashbacks. Both take place in a mall. We've got this cute little photo booth picture. Both have a journey for Ellie that changes the course of her life. It's great. Oh, and Laura and this couple left behind her partner. The theme is everywhere! Wow! Please don't mind my complete lack of awareness. We all know I'm terrible at video games. But Ellie's knife is just as busted as it is in the base game. It makes me wonder why Joel never decided to find himself just a really nice pocket knife instead of taping scissors to a piece of wood. Ellie keeping with her trade of having outbursts when she's angry, like kicking this box, smashing these pots, or showing the world just how pro-choice she is. You know, the usual. Here we go. Again, with the dope transitions connecting the two timelines. Ellie is rocking the same backpack as the flashback, and in the winter section of the main game, you can even see the pun book and more importantly, Radley's Firefly pendant in her pack while playing as her, meaning that she went back to grab all of their things. You've run into more infected? As part of my initiation, they actually made me kill this. You know? Let's talk about something else. The Fireflies like to prop themselves up as freedom fighters, but there's a lot of evidence in the first game that they aren't as squeaky clean as their propaganda would imply. Exactly the same as Fedra. 30 days, my ass. I mean, they decided to murder a little girl on the hope that they can vaccinate a fungal infection. There are two sides of the same coin, really. Hence Joel, Tess, and Ellie's attitude towards them. We don't know much about what happened in the 20-year time skip, but it's pretty safe to assume that Joel has been in the Boston QC ever since Ellie was born. These two people that would change each other's lives so monumentally, living so close together and never even knowing it for 14 years is insanely cool to me. I have a surprise for you. What? Is it a dinosaur? Maybe. I'll be your friend again if it's a dinosaur. Ellie not putting the brakes on the fact that she really, really wants to see some dinosaurs. So each of these movies relate to the themes present in The Last of Us and Left Behind. We've got Forgotten Place. What is the Forgotten Place? It's the place where we get to be a kid again, feel safe, and fall in love. Like the mall. But that's long been gone since the outbreak. And you'll notice the house the girl is walking up to isn't as inviting. And we'll see later on, neither is this mall. Then Dawn of the Wolf, an obvious parody of Twilight... Or is it? Dawn of the Wolf seems to be about a relationship being strained by the fact that the other has this aspect about them they can't change, such as Ellie being immune, or to a lesser degree, Riley being a firefly. Then we got Atlas. A solitary soldier is running away from a ruined city. Atlas is the titan who holds the world on his shoulders. Joel held the world's fate on his shoulders when he had to choose whether to save Ellie or not, and in his wake, left a city, i.e. the fireflies, and Abby in Ruin. Then Across the Sky, a romance movie where it seems that the sun will set on either their relationship or their lives. It's called Across the Sky, like the sun traveling across the sky and it can only stay high and bright for so long and eventually it has to come down. Just like Ellie and Riley riding high in the mall till they're both bit and plan to have their lives set together. And then we've got off-brand Jesse Heisenberg who represents her. I'm kidding, but don't it look like a Chad version of him? And the 2020 Optic Center is actually a reference to how much better this game looks than yours, bitch. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mind a bit here. Do you know how it happened? They said he just fell off his horse. Yeah, a lot of people say that. Bingo. Want some? There will always be something innately captivating about watching two kids just run around and be kids. Experiencing new things that we adults take for granted, such as our first drink. It always cuts to all our core because deep down, we all wish we could just be a kid again. And speaking of that, we've got the title itself, Left Behind. The title in Ellie's journey through both malls is a reminder of those things we leave behind just to survive. Like celebrating holidays, taking silly pictures with friends and loved ones, enjoying a carnival ride, falling in love, going on dates, and in the more dramatic sense, what parts of ourselves that we leave behind. The pharmacist locking their colleague in the room for acting strange like an animal. The slow loss of respect for the dead, each other, and, and the end themselves that we see in the helicopter crew story. And in the main game, Joel left behind the idea of ever being able to love again just to get along one more day. Four lines for 140? Shit, maybe it was for the best that the world ended if uh, these are the phone prices in 2013. Speaking of the start, do you think there are some weirdos that celebrate Outbreak Day in this universe?
Bet there are. Come on, I got the perfect mask for you. And then finding the Halloween store is so cute. Halloween is the epitome of innocence for me. We all dress up as scary monsters and villains because nowadays we are so safe and secure that we actively seek things to make us afraid. That's a luxury this world they live in doesn't allow anymore. People are constantly terrified. So just for a moment, our girls get to enjoy a holiday that is basically happening all the time around them in its true fashion. So stupid. Now roar. Roar. All the moments Riley and Ellie share in the mall before the infected show up, it's a constant breakdown of the walls they've been forced to build up living in this world. Ellie thinks this is all stupid since it's not focused on survival or planning the next move and feels like silly kid stuff. Even when she's only 14. Gustavo Santalaya returns, of course, using his talents to soak this sequence with this melancholic and relaxing track. A sad reminder of what was lost 20 years ago, but also a bit of respite from this new world. Ha 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 ha! The ruby slippers! What have you done with them? Huh. You'd expect culture to be the first things to go the way of Joel in The Last of Us Part 2 when the world falls apart. But they've held on to a couple things, it seems. The world is now like a nightmare version of the Land of Oz for those who weren't born into it. In a way, those kids have it easier, never having to know a life that they lost. Oh, Triple Phoenix. Triple Phoenix in this world is a three-player brawler based on a cartoon centered around mutated pigeons. Or, the other game we hear about, The Turning. Seems a lot of nods to the infection with these names and premises for these games. Also the name Angel Knives. Quite ironic putting those together when you consider her finishing move of punching a hole in someone's chest and kicking their head off. Not really a joke to me. But you can really see Angel Knives as Ellie. She punches a hole in Joel's heart and replaces it with love. Then roundhounds his head off his shoulders to be so dumb to lower his guard in the second game. I mean, so that he can open up to Ellie and teach her to survive. Are we gonna die today? Seems dreadfully unlikely. So you're telling me there's a chance. Ah, uh, you hear that? Says we're getting our water guns back. Let them go, Ellie. Let them go. Riley feeds to Ellie that they are completely gone to make her surprise later even better. I'm sure we've all done that to someone before. This is a subtle nod to how Riley is going to come back from the dead. Are you kidding me? I'm like the Brickmaster. At all of us who played this shit on Grounded. Wrong card, yeah. Totally didn't mean to do that and glad Riley acknowledged it. All that stuff I said before I left. I didn't mean any of it. Ah, the classic. I'm going to say the most hurtful things to make the departure easier in both of us. Are you kidding? Another slick transition using the brightness of the lights to connect us. And keeping us on the hook so we'll keep playing to see what Ellie is looking at. I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go. Ellie's not going to leave Joel behind. And this makes the entire winter section even sweeter for their entire journey together. Ellie fought as hard as she could to save Joel's life, and he didn't even know it. And then Joel, wounded, did the exact same thing for her, and she didn't even know it. Bringing us to that moment in the cabin after David. Riley, come here! No, you got this. Go! <laughs> what the heck? This is awesome. All the things we take for granted in our day-to-day. -day. It's just going in circles, technically. But with the lights and the horse and being with a loved one, it makes these moments so special. Fully. Well, I loved it. So there. Oh, that little lip bite and reassurance. Our girl's crushing a horde. What did the triangle say to the circle? <gasps> what is that? You're so pointless. Now every time we play in the game and we get the pun book out, it's gonna be a cute stop up, yes, but also some time to remember Riley. And with getting to watch them just be kids, who really expected a DLC of Date Night would be so entertaining? I mean, it's Ellie, so it could have been almost anything and we would have been there for it. <laughs> I think we did too. <laughs> so... so. Some great chemistry between Ashley Johnson and Yanni King. You can't tell me you haven't had this awkward moment when on a date about where to go or what to say next. You want to keep exploring? But Riley comes in with a save to postpone the inedible kiss. I gotta do that again. Ellie's speaking for all of us. Even as an adult, I freaking love the little airport speed walkie thingy. And yet, drop dead gorgeous angel knives. Am I supposed to picture all this? Eyes. Okay, sorry. She stands on the edge of the Shadow Temple. That's some awesome sound design. It's not until Ellie's fully immersing herself that we hear Riley in both ears instead of quietly on the side. 
Moments like these are what 3D headphones are built for. There, he overshot you. You land behind him, quickly, punch him in the back. They really are just playing D&D &D right now. Still, a really cool creative way for both Riley and Naughty Dog to have us play Mortal Kombat, I mean the turning in this. Which gets me thinking, D&D &D would be THE game to play in the apocalypse. All right. Yes. Damn. And the more we get into it, Riley's voice fades out and we get this amazing lighting on Ellie's face really showing how immersed our girl is. And it's moments like these where part one really shines. From the lighting on Ellie's face to the depth of her expressions, it's really impressive. Finish him. Really don't know how they dodge a lawsuit. But I'm gonna assume it's because Fatality is probably the NetherRealm's trademark. Can they trademark that? Is that like the YouTube gods, the fine bros trying to trademark React? Again and again until his heart flies right out of his chest. Yeah! She winds back her leg and roundhouses his head clean off. The lighting even matches the descriptions. It getting all red when his heart flies and the dramatic fast when Angel Knives plays soccer or football, if you like beans on bread for breakfast, with Black Fang's head. They're picking me up tomorrow. Okay, seems to be Ellie's go-to phrase when she's given bad news. Why did you bring me here? I wanted to see you. Left Behind does a great job of balancing the dramatics with the lighthearted scenes. Never does one overstay its welcome. But when it comes to the more serious stuff, it does feel a bit jarring, but in the best way possible. Only because it's been so easy to get caught up in all this cute fun that we're forgetting about what is out there. When she goes after Riley, the camera lingers on some giraffes. There's significance of that utmost innocence in this series. Oh god, exit signs and backstages have been ruined for me because of The Last of Us Part 2. Bring me straight back to that scene and oof. And yeah, I did some shit that I don't know how to take back. Those water guns you've been dreaming of? I nearly got shot for these. Well, that's one way to really start making up for things. Or making Ellie feel extremely guilty. Okay. First, I'm gonna destroy you. And then we'll talk. For a 14-year-old, Ellie navigated this perfectly. I would not know what to have said to Riley coming off that. Really digging the dual sense with this trigger resistance as always. Another thing that makes the part one a banger. It will never get old using game mechanics crafted for violence in a cute fun way. I gotta go back. Okay, fine. Can I at least walk you home? It really is a date, the walking home and everything. Wonder if they'll kiss at the door. Who am I to stop you? <laughs> the one person that can. No, please don't go. I'll be so miserable without you. Naughty Dog has some riders on their team. It's so normal and real to take a super serious moment and throw a joke in it, but still completely mean it. This is also just endearing as shit. You should keep these. It's not gonna do me any good. Especially considering the next 10 minutes. <laughs> This is I Got You Babe by Etta James, a song that's just completely, overtly a love song, but one full of fiery, carefree passion, exactly like these two. Hell, Riley is blaring this knowing they're outside of the cues you're not caring or thinking because she's into this girl too much. Also, Riley put this on the tape for Ellie, so they're even throwing hints like back in the day. I wish I grew up in the times when people would give mixed states or CDs. Just grew up right on the threshold of that with MP3 players. And the light and the way the boxes are in case makes this look like a fancy dance floor. And I love the static wide shot like the one we saw earlier. The decay of our old world being reclaimed by nature. Once again uncaring of the fun and love these two are sharing, but nonetheless, they give this room life. In less than an hour, they introduce a new character with one we've already seen grow and change so much, back her up and write her pre all growth consistently, and makes us care about and believe their relationship and have this kiss feel earned in about an hour. Very much reminds me of HBO's The Last of Us' episode three. And right on cue, just when everything is perfect, the infected gotta come in and ruin it for us. Huh. So that's why Joel has his bow while going after Ellie. I always thought it was a plot hole, but nah, she's got her own. Also explains why none of the upgrades transfer over in the winter chapter for her. Son of a bitch. Left Behind is the first time we fight infected and humans at the same time. Something about not having enough time to program it to make it work, but it does here and it really changes the way you have to approach the fights. Let's go. Oh. Down there, by the door! We gotta f 
down. Go finish her. This last gauntlet does not mess around either. You've really got to try hard to succeed here. Okay, their kid's in a tense situation. They probably didn't think to have Ellie just hold it for Riley after she got on the other side. Just drop the door completely. Infected people are scary, and people do dumb things when they're scared. So this is where Ellie gets bit, even if we never actually see the infected bite her, which is kind of a shame. But what I do like is that her bite isn't anything special. It's not significant. It doesn't save a life or anything. It was actually pretty stupid how they got caught, and that's just how it should be for a couple of kids. Joel's got a nice case of dad gut. Just stay calm, buddy. Stay calm. <laughs> juxtapositional comedy also shows her growth of dealing with life and death situations but we fight for every second we get to spend with each other whether it's two minutes or two days every second counts and i really love that this is framed as ellie remembering these words from riley as she's fighting for every second with joel and with neither of them taking option one neither of them will leave the other behind by choice we all poetic and just lose our minds together she said the thing What's option three? Little did Ellie know that she was option three. Come on. Let's get out of here. The dramatic irony is so heartbreaking since it's pretty much confirmed that Ellie had to put down Riley. And then a beautiful ending that is kind of left open-ended for what exactly happens next. Something that's a bit of a trend with these games. And a neat reminder that we are seeing a slice of their lives and there's so much more to these people. And of course, ending a game on no dialogue, but just that beautiful score by Gustavo. What a tight DLC. A complete story that takes a little over an hour to complete. That provides interesting context to how Ellie saved Joel, but more importantly, Ellie's relationship with Riley and her getting bitten. I really didn't expect it to be possible in any way to have story DLC for The Last of Us, but Naughty Dog pulled it off. And the best part about it is it doesn't feel required to enjoy The Last of Us 2 or 1 to its fullest. This little story really does just feel like a little labor of love from a small group of the team because they wanted a bit more time with Ellie. This DLC is really just a semi-awkward date between two kids, and that's where The Last of Us has always been its strongest, in the hopeful, beautiful moments among all the horror and chaos. Something that The Last of Us Part 2 kind of forgot about. The Last of Us Part 1 is actually quite a hopeful, beautiful game that leaves you feeling conflicted about Joel's choice and Ellie's reaction to his lie, but also happy and satisfied by the journey you just went on and that Ellie and Joel get to carry on together. Left Behind is similar. Ellie did lose Riley, but ended up saving Joel for a little while. And it's most likely because of Riley that Ellie decided to wait out the infection. Because of her, that she's still alive for Joel to meet her. And most likely her motivation throughout when Joel was wounded. On a grander scale, like when Ellie says, everything we've been through, everything I've done, it can't be for nothing. Riley's on that list, and we finally got the full picture of that, and she's for sure a reason she wants to make the final push to the Fireflies. And that's what additional stories like these should do. Elevate their original material while standing on its own. Left Behind was a cute little story that kind of came out of nowhere when it was released, and The Last of Us universe is all the better for it. What do you think about it? And while we're at it, HBO's The Last of Us series. Let me know, and remember, drive the speed limit, drink some water, and love one another. Pizza.